Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Laurie Obueta. I'm one of the counselling psychologists that works here. Um, firstly, I just want to take a moment to thank every single one of you for coming out today. We really, really do appreciate it. Then as well, just some practical arrangements. So please ensure that you did sign in at reception. Uh, if you did not, then please just make sure that you sign in before you leave because we won't be able to issue you your certificate without your signature. Then as well, the lavatories is straight out of this room, second door on the right hand side at the end of the room, you will see there's a sign that says bathroom. Then we'll also be providing some snacks and as well some refreshments after Dr. Arliss's presentation, which will be served in the boardroom as well as some coffee and tea. Uh, for those who haven't viewed the facility, you're more than welcome as well after the presentation to go have a look. Um, then, for those of you who don't know, Arc Addiction Recovery Centre is an alcohol and drug rehab facility. Uh, this month actually marks our 10th year, which we're very proud of. Uh, in 2015, we hosted our first CPD meeting, uh, and now we are very fortunate and excited to be hosting our second one. I really just don't hope that the third one takes another seven years to come about. Um, so before I introduce our keynote speaker, I just want to take a moment to thank some individuals. So firstly, the lady that just left, Suzette de Pinard, she's our relationship manager. She's actually the one that initiated the whole CPD meeting, got the ball rolling, organized for everybody to be here. So it wouldn't have been possible without her. And then as well, our director at the back, Ryan Barnard, it also wouldn't have been possible without him. And then as well for Dr. Arles, which was so kind to accept our invitation to come to be the speaker tonight. So um, I also just want to mention that as part of our New Year's endeavors, we have launched a podcast to create a bit of awareness on dual diagnosis. So we would really appreciate to be able to contact some of you to come onto the podcast and, and be a bit of a guest speaker. Um, but I'm very sure that Suzette will contact you in the coming few weeks. So don't be shocked if you get the phone call. Um, so then without further ado, our keynote speaker tonight is Dr. Eugene Arles, which is a psychiatrist in private practice. And he's going to present on this very long title, which I'm gonna read for you to make sure I don't miss anything. He's going to present on exploring the genetics of substance use disorder and the association with other psychiatric disorders. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, so many people here, but I was shocked. I got nervous. <laughs> I didn't think that so many would attend. Um, yeah, I, I'm so happy to see some of the Glenview people here as well, because they're going to help me out a lot tonight. <laughs> Especially Kobus there in the corner. He thinks he's not going to work, but he knows much more about, about genetics than I will ever know. <laughs> so if any questions, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it is an interesting su uh, uh, subject because it is, there's a lot of new stuff in terms of genetics and uh, genetics is sort of the future, you know, in terms of medicine, in terms of psychiatry. So we keep on looking at are there any new things about genetics and unfortunately I must tell you there are not a lot of, not a lot of new things. I thought there's got to be more when I started investigating and looking at the, the whole subject. But it's still quite interesting because it, you know, it will tell us a little bit about how to manage patients on a, on a, on a psychotherapeutic level in some ways, but also kind of a look at you know, where should we go in, in thinking differently about psychiatric disorders and about substance use disorder especially. Okay. So globally, it is a massive problem. You can see the World Organization estimating in 2004 there were like 52 million people with substance use disorder and alcohol and drugs, but it's now gone to 150 million. So that is, that's quite a, a massive increase. And there needs to be an understanding of how we're going to manage people with this. So in terms of psychiatry and substance use disorder, you can see 30% of patients with major depressive disorder also have a substance use disorder. 23.1% with substance use disorder has ADHD. 40% of patients with general anxiety disorder has substance use disorder. And 50% of patients with schizophrenia has a substance use disorder. So substance use disorder is very comorbid or co-occurring a lot with, with one another. 
So there's a lot to do with substance use disorder and, and, and mental illness and psychiatric illnesses. And you can see it, it goes from you know, 20, a quarter to a half. And, and interestingly enough, if you look at the blue and the yellow line, you know, the blue line is the percentage of serious mental illness co-occurring with substance use disorder. And substance use disorder with serial mental illness is the, the orange line. So there's many more patients with substance use disorder if they've got a mental illness. But if you've got a substance use disorder, mental illness is not so common. So it seems to us substance use disorder is, you know, there's less incidence of, of psychiatric disorders. <clears throat> So there is a lot of, of um, current problems, but I, I've, I've referred to this specific article quite a lot, the Genetic Epidemiology of Substance Use Disorder a Review, um, which was written in 2017, but also reference to other um, stuff. But before we actually can understand genetics and how genetics works, I think it's important that we also look at the neurobiology of substance use disorders. And in particular, it's very important that we look at how the brain functions. Now, this is obviously a lateral view, a side view of the brain. And what I want to specifically refer to is this nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area of the VTA. This is the frontal cortex. That's the striatum and that's the substantia nigra just on top of the ventral tegmental area. Now the ventral tegmental area in the midbrain, it sits here in the midbrain, if you can look at the, this is the cortex, that's the small brain, the cerebellum, <coughs> this little white portion here is the midbrain. So in the midbrain, there's a nucleus or an area, <coughs> which we call the ventral tegmental area, and that part secretes a lot of dopamine. Now dopamine <coughs> is very important in terms of the reward system in humans. Um, it's also a very important dopamine in terms of movement. Now, if you look at the substantia nigra here on top, that is the area in the brain that's filled with dopamine that, monitor, that, that helps us to move and, and coordinate movement. Now, in people with Parkinson's disease, where you have slowness, shuffling, tremors, they have an absence or a very low dopamine in that substantia nigra. So when we treat uh, patients with Parkinson's, we give them a, a drug that actually enhances uh, the dopamine in that specific area and then they get better. But these two are connected. They are sort of one area. But the VTA is very important to psychiatry and psychiatrists because that area in the brain has projections to the frontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens, and, and that is part of the limbic system, what we call the limbic system. Now, the limbic system controls our emotions. So, um, you know, it makes you feel bad and sad and glad and everything in between um, <clears throat> because it helps with that. And then frontal cortex, of course, our personalities are here, and it also helps us, you know, it, it's the major area with cognition. So dopamine is important in controlling our thinking, our emotions, our personality, our emotions, how we feel, and we feel happy. So this is quite important. But the nucleus accumbens that sits here, and it's part of the, what we call the striatum, okay? The striatum is a section in the brain that also helps us to move, that to further regulate our movement. And it's part of the motor cortex of the brain, which sits on the other side of the brain, but it sits here and it connects with this part and it helps us to control movement. But the integration of movement and reward and happiness is critical. Okay, so, so, so it's important to note then the nucleus acubens who sits here. There's two nuclear acubenses that are sort of connected on each hemisphere. I'll show you another picture that's 3D. But that area is specific to the reward system. So for instance, if you sniff a little bit of cocaine, you get a massive release of dopamine. And that is why people sniff cocaine, because it makes you feel very lekker and happy. So that is the area in the brain specific to reward and feeling happy, because it secretes a specific neurotransmitter dopamine that makes us feel happy and, and, and very nice. So if we eat ice cream, Woolies triple caramel, salted caramel ice cream, <laughs> then, 
it lights up the, <laughs> the nucleus acumens. <laughs> if you've not tried that ice cream, there are only two kinds of people, those have tried it and those that don't. So <laughs> when you bite into that piece of fudge, ugh. But uh, so <laughs> you can see my, my dopamine lighting up already. So <laughs> but that's, that, that is very critical to our understanding of how the brain works in the reward system. That area, particularly, interestingly enough, also connects to an area here in the brain which we call the PAG, the periaqueductal gray. There's a little area there that, that helps us to control pain. So when you feel happy, you secrete dopamine. The dopamine suppresses or makes the, 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 the um, periaqueductal gray secrete internal opiates or our own morphine to suppress pain. And that's why when you're happy, you don't feel pain. When you're sad and upset, you feel your pain. So it's a very intricate system of, of how the brain works. Just a little bit of an extension on that. You can see there's the nucleus accumbens sitting there. There's the big movement center. Interestingly enough, there's the amygdala, and that is the center, the primitive center of memory that makes us fear things. And then the memory sits there, the hippocampus. So it's a very interesting limbic system that controls this whole area in the, in the brain. Okay. Now the 3D picture looks like this. You can see there is the caudate nucleus, that primitive fear thing, memory. Inside here is the nucleus accumbens, and these, these, this is the striatum. Okay. Now what is important in this kind of thing, and why it's so important that we understand that, is when it, it is, has to do a lot with feeding and how we feed. So when we reach food, or we get to food, you know, we feel happy. And people eat together, and they, and, they, and they gather food. So when you get to food, you secrete dopamine. Now, once you've learned, and you've understood, you know, this is where I can find food, and this is my reward, every time you've got to go seek food. Okay, so you've got to go out like a horse, or a kudu or something and you understand you know or an elephant sometimes they live in dry places so they know there's food there they'll walk miles to get to the food um, because it's part of the reward system to move towards a reward so the movement towards a reward and the reward itself is important in this whole process so what happens in the brain is um, I've got a little graph here that uh, forget that that if you have this is unexpected reward, this is expected reward, and that's never the negative prediction error. Now, the two imp important is, this is dopamine activity, this is the baseline, this is the cue, you see the food, and that's the reward, or you think about the food. Now, look at this, it's interesting. In the beginning, when we sniff cocaine, or we take alcohol, or we eat, triple caramel ice cream, the, you, when you eat it, you secrete dopamine and you feel good. But if you do it often, you, your body starts realizing, I need this. So then what it does, it, it activates the motor system, that striatum, to motivate you to get up and go look for that substance or food. So if there's an expected reward, you start getting the dopamine release when you think about that. So when you think about the triple caramel, you start thinking, oh, it's so good. You get in your car and you go buy it. Now this is what happens with people that use drugs. They only think of it, there's a cue. They think of it and then they already start feeling magnificent. And that drives them to get the substance. And this is how addiction behavior starts. You know, they sell their car, they everything. People say, are you mad? How can you do that? I mean, you, you've sold your house for, some, for, for, for a fix. It's impossible. The reason for that is because that makes you feel magnificent. It makes you feel good. So that the drive for addictive behavior to go get your substance or go buy your ice cream or go get your food is overwhelming, okay? And you can see, when you get the substance, there's no dopamine. 
that getting the substance is the fix. And then you have to get it because you've spent all the energy and that, but there is actually not a really release, a lot of release of dopamine. Now you can imagine, in terms of treatment of patients, this is quite important because the search of dopamine is not, get, it's not the drug itself eventually, it's that whole search for it. Okay. Now that is obviously what one has to treat because you have to stop that search of dopamine. So in terms of genetics, think of it. How the brain works and how the whole body works is on genes. So your genes actually regulate what you do. Now people always think just genes is just there with your little fetus to give you an arm and a leg and a liver and a brain. But everything you do, everything you smell changes your genes. Everything you taste changes your genes. Everything that happens around you has an in, is, is modulated by your genetic makeup and what your genes do at that particular moment. So, you know, I always laugh at the anti-vaxxers that say this new vaccine is going to change your genes. Uh, what did you think? <laughs> Eating an ice cream changes your genes. <laughs> Eating your steak changes your genes. Looking at this person changes my genes. I mean, what did you think? <laughs> I would be worried if it didn't, you know, because it's supposed to. So, but now the question is, what makes this dopamine release that is under the influence of genes because learning is a neurogenetic you know it causes neurogenesis it's a, it's, a, it's a genetic process to save information is a genetic process now if we want to treat patients with medicines or gene therapy or anything else we'll have to give them medicines that would change the release of the dopamine. Now people squirm always when you say gene therapy. That's the future. I'll get a little bit into it a little bit later. But that is what we need to do. Now obviously psycho psychotherapeutic interventions, rehab, psychiatric hospitals, psychiatric medication, to a large extent does that. Older medicines worked on chemicals, the newer medicines work on genes. Because when we give people, for instance, an SSRI, or an antidepressant, we know that they also start releasing brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a chemical in your brain that makes the brain grow and respond. And SSRIs do that, and then you start forming new connections in your brain. So, medicines is gene therapy in many ways, because it makes the brain grow. Um, some older medicines like stelazine and serenase actually makes the brain die because it's anti-gene. So we don't like to give those medicines anymore. So, but the development of medicines in terms of substance use disorder will very much have to concentrate on this kinds of thing. Okay, so the question is, are there more people prone to addiction because they've got a hypersensitive dopaminergic system? Okay, or an underdeveloped dopaminergic system? Now what the research tells us in most people who have addictive problems or an addictive nature or an addictive personality, yes, there is an underlying genetic fault. And one of the problems is that a lot of people do not develop their dopaminergic system adequately. And a lot of people have done work on why do people have an underactive dopaminergic system. And the interesting thing is that you as a child develop a, your dopaminergic system to respond to certain stimuli as a reward to feel good. Um, so for instance when you have a child and they do something or they paint or they draw something and you reward them by saying oh wonderful good or you give him something then they they start secreting their dopamine and they understand okay this is the behavior I've got to do and they will actually actively seeking to do that. So when they start getting older and they do the dishes and they make their beds and they dress themselves and they bath themselves, you know, and you say, oh, you are so fantastic. Or they, when they make their first meal or bake their first muffin and you put it on a WhatsApp group and all the grandmothers say, wow, when are you inviting us? They secrete dopamine, you know. 
Now the problem is with adolescents is if they're on the social media and they say hi and they get 50 highs because they've got 50 people, you know, hi, they get addicted to their phone because, woo, I get a hi, you know, and, and they start chatting. And that, that starts the addictive behavior. But it's important that children get stimulated early on by rewards and not necessarily monetary rewards and sweets and stuff, but that's important. I mean, children love sweets, so it's easy to. So, but it's, and it's important. But then they develop a very good dopaminergic system. One of the problems we see uh, is that when, when children are spoiled, they don't get rewards because they don't do anything. You know, there's maids in the house, they, parents do everything for them. You know, they get up in the morning, parents wake them up, they get up, breakfast is ready, mother dresses them, brush your teeth, go to school. They do nothing, so you can never say, wow, look what you've done. So then there's no, never a reward. It's very comfortable, but it's, it's awful for your dopaminergic system. The opposite, the same thing happens in kids that, are, that grow up in, 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 in emotionally poor circumstances. You know, like in townships where parents both work and the kids have to look after themselves and they have to fend for themselves because they're no sort of <coughs> parents. It's poor and they have to fight for what they want and then they learn how to get rewards in a different kind of way. But still, their dopaminergic system is underdeveloped. So in very affluent societies where there's lots of maids and money and lots of poor societies, you often get the problem because people live in the circumstances where they never get reward. And this system is underactivated. So, what, so then they suddenly learn when they get to adolescence, ha, huh, one way I can activate my system is by sniffing something or by drinking something, or by smoking something. And that activates the dopaminergic system because they've got an underdeveloped dopaminergic system. So that's one of the reasons why people develop that. And that is under the influence of genes because, you know, your genes actually activate or teach you or develop your neuroconnectivity in your brain to be responsive to praise or reward on, a, on a, an emotional level or on a physical drug level. And that's all under the influence of genes. Okay. So, so that, the, the question then is, you know, is it inherited? Is it nature? Is it nurture? What, what actually does this? Okay. So just a little biology again. The ventral striatum mediates the reward system and the dorsal striatum motivates the motor function. So, you know, this striatum thing that we talk about, the motion, that's how it works. Okay. So the, first, the question people asked was, is there a specific phenotype that would make the individuals more vulnerable to substance use disorder? And a phenotype is, um, if you look at dogs, you know, you get small dogs, big dogs, funny dogs, colored dogs, black, white, spots. It's all dog. But you know, you can tell the difference between a Border Collie and a German Shepherd. So there's, that's a different phenotype. There's different phenotypes of the same thing. They're all dogs. They can interbreed. Okay, so that's how phenotypes work. But so we, we, when we talk about phenotypes, we also ask, are there individuals with a specific genetic makeup, which we call then a phenotype, that would make them more vulnerable to substance use disorder? That doesn't mean they have to be blonde or male or whatever. It, it's just in their genes. You can't see it, but it is there. So they've done research to see, is there a specific genetic makeup phenotype? that makes individuals more prone to substance use disorder. Okay. But you have to look quite a lot to actually get to that. You have to look at lots of things in genetics to understand it. There's inherited traits, in other words, nature, when you earn, that you get from your parents. Black hair, blonde hair. They nurture the, the, the environment that you grew up in and where you currently find your the genetic variation in your gene makeup, in this genetics that you've got, how you metabolize certain substances. Because one of the problems they said is, if a person has a, is a fast metabolizer, remember that the liver, this side, the liver <laughs> metabolizes drugs. So if you use alcohol or if you use substances and you're a fast metabolizer and you metabolize drugs fast, would you then not it goes out of your body so fast that you would crave it again. And then so people that smoke, for instance, you know, if they're fast metabolizers of nicotine, they would become chain smokers because they have to fill up their nicotine because they metabolize it fast. So that's the one thing. Then there's cessation genes. In other words, 
there's a gene that makes you stop smoking or stop drinking or stop using cocaine. So there's a cessation gene and there's also epigenetics. Epigenetics is what's sort of written on a gene. Now genes are all rolled up into little uh, into you know, chromosomes in your nucleus and you can see it but you have to unravel it to read it to do something with it. And that's epigenetics, is where you unroll this gene, you know, it makes, it, it, it's supposed to do what it does. For instance, if you're a little fetus and you start developing a heart, that portion of your gene has to unroll to say, okay, now we're forming heart. And that gene has to unroll and say, okay, now we're forming liver. So that's, that's so it's quite complicated in terms of that. So let's look at twin studies. You know, so to understand, is there a phenotype? In other words, it also inherited kind of situation. In, in genes, we look at twins, and there are lots of twin studies. They take identical and non-identical twins, and then they compare them in the same environment, in different environments, and say, you know, but if, if you have identical twins, and there's a high incidence of concordance, where they all um, drug, become drug addicted, then obviously there must be some genetic underlay. Now, in alcohol, 50 to 70 percent of the variation in terms of your genetic, in, in twin studies, there's a concordance of 50 to 70 percent of inheritable factors. So alcohol seems to us, it has got a fairly large component of genetic inheritance. Okay, so if your parents or you come from a family where alcohol is a problem, you stand a, a higher chance of becoming addicted to, uh, to alcohol specifically. Okay. But then there's also a fairly large 50-30% environmental factor. So it's not all doom and gloom, you know, if my parents, it's over, I've got it. So there is an environmental factor as well. Um, so individuals with an alcoholic parent have a five times more likelihood of becoming alcoholic. So this, there is definitely a genetic uh, thing. Okay. So genetic influence is about 50%, environmental factors about 50%, okay. Cannabis though, cannabis availability accounted for 92 to 96% of shared environmental and only 2 to 3% of genetic influences. Mm -hmm. So cannabis is environmental. <laughs> mm. It's the same in, in psychiatry for instance, bipolar, it's got an 86% genetic inheritability, whereas anorexia nervosa, 5%. It's mostly environmental. So that's interesting to know. So when it comes to cannabis, really, you have to look at the environment. So it's under huge environmental uh, influence. So different to alcohol, okay. So if we look at how we actually then go further in understanding this inheritability or phenotypes, we have to look at what is called GWAS studies, uh, genome-wide association studies. They take the genome, which is the gene, and then they take lots of hundreds of thousands of people with and without <coughs> the disorder, and they see if there's a difference in terms of the genetic makeup of these individuals. It doesn't tell you much. It tells you they could be, because it's, it's complicated. And they have to use large groups of people because you have billions of vari variations, probably trillions of variations in your gene because you've got, you know, you know it's, it's massive that where you can actually have these, <coughs> these, these differences. But they found that there's 2,976 novel candidate genetic loci. A locus, is, a locus is an area on the brain that determines whether a plant would have a green or a red flower, or a red or a blue flower. So these loci for substance use traits have been identified. So that's nearly 3,000. So that makes it even more complicated because it was one. We can say that's the gene that causes the problem. So in some genetic disorders, when there's one gene, when we test somebody and we found, find one locus, we know so gene therapy there is very easy because you can just attack the gene, <coughs> remove that wrong gene and put another one in and the person is, po is cured. Like they do in certain lung diseases of children. 
So they can actually do genetic modifications in certain children that would have died from certain lung diseases now and modify the gene so that they don't die. So that can happen already. But not in this circumstances because this, this circumstance is complicated. There's 3,000 of those genes. So, ugh. But there seems to be some genetic underlay. Okay. So a genome <coughs> is all the genetic information on an organism. It consists of nucleotide sequences of the DNA. You can see the, the DNA is the circular thing with the little connections. Those are called the nucleotides. And the genome includes both the genes and the non-coding DNA. <coughs> you get coding DNA that codes for certain proteins and non-coding DNA, but don't worry too much of this. And then, of course, you get your mitochondrial DNA, which is your mother's DNA, and that's where they test where you come from from your mother's side. And if you want to test your paternity side, you test your Y gene. So women can't test their paternity side because they don't have a Y gene. But they can ask their brothers. And hopefully they came from the same father. <laughs> In South Africa, 30% of children is not the father who they think they are. <laughs> so that's not that accurate, unfortunately. Okay. Um, there are genes that have they've identified. GABRA2, for instance, is a gene that one or more copies of the A allele individual is more likely to report illicit drug dependence. Several genes, including the GABRA, the CNR1, the CWL, to be associated with adolescent antisocial drug dependence. So they've identified certain genes already that could be involved with this whole thing. In adolescence, we know that schizophrenia, if you have a deficit of COMPT, um, COMPT controls your quibus. Farasa. Colin, yeah. Something O methyl transferase. But um, it, it, it controls, in actual fact, COMPT is part of your dopaminergic system. And a, a, a DA, where you have deficiency in that particular gene and you smoke cannabis, you will become, you, there's a very likely chance that you'll become schizophrenic. And there's now four genes, further four genes identified. If you have those four genes, one of them or a combination of them, your chances of becoming completely psychotic and develop schizophrenia is very high. So, you know, if you, if your chance going to smoke Dacha, let them test them first because they can develop schizophrenia. <laughs> so Dacha can cause schizophrenia, we know now. So if patients ask, can Dacha cause schizophrenia? Yes, it can. Okay. Nicotine, there's a lot of things on smoking because smoking is so common and they've done a lot of things. You can see there's also receptors and SNPs. SNPs is little, a SNP is a, an abnormal locus. With normal people, I mean, people would have these loci and they know what the genome is like because they could se sequence it. And then some people have a difference. And then they call it a SNP. And, and then they identify it and say, yes, people with this particular SNP has got a problem. Okay. So there's eight SNPs in, in genome-wide GWAS studies uh, with a very strong association with smoking, as well as what, you know, the, 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 the SNPs controlling brain-derived neuro neurotrophic factor that makes your brain grow. And that, so there is a strong association with certain SNPs as well. And then on chromosome 9 is also. But the interesting thing is, on chromosome 9, there's a SNP that is associated with smoking cessation. So if you've got that gene, or you've got double that gene, some people have, then your chances of stopping smoking is very easy. If you've got, not a, not, 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 uh, if you've got a polymorphism that doesn't, that's sort of half-half, then you get people that struggle to smoke, to stop smoking. Then you get people like that Val Val that we saw now, where if they, they, they've got absence of this gene, then they cannot stop smoking. And a high proportion of people with chronic obstructive airways disease or emphysema don't have the cessation, the cessation gene. They lack the ability to stop smoking. So what happens is, you know, we doctors in the hospital know in the hospital you get these patients with severe emphysema. They blew, they want oxygen. <laughs> and the next thing is the cigarette goes in the oxygen mask and they smoke. And you think, can you, for goodness sake, how is it possible you're busy dying from smoking? 
but you still smoke through the oxygen, and nobody and everybody hopes it doesn't explode, because you know fire going in the oxygen. But they simply cannot stop smoking. So there is now a lot of research that's gone into this particular thing, because they think if you can activate that cessation gene, then it will be much more easy for people to stop smoking. And the wonderful thing is there's one SNP on chromosome 9 that controls it, which makes it easy to, to, to with gene therapy, to activate that gene. So the future of, of, of this is probably in genetic modification and, and gene therapies where you will be able to attack that specific chromosome and that specific SNP to change the people without, with a lack of the cessation gene to get a cessation gene. So then it will be easier to treat this, the substance use disorders and especially smoking because then you're going to have the ability to stop smoking or stop using the drug. Alcohol, um, they are signaling genes in terms of cholinergic, nicotinic receptor, metabolism, all sorts of things with alcohol that they've researched. And, and, and that's where we are. That's we, unfortunately, we are with genetics. They've not been able to do anything about the genetics, but they seem to start understanding that there are phenotypes that we can identify, but there's the biggest work will probably be on the cessation gene. Okay. With DACA, of course, it won't work because DACA is mostly environmental. But it could work because people still do get addicted, so it might work, you know. Anyway, okay, then there's the big sub subject of epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is interesting because epigenetics is the study of what's really written on the gene. So we know what genes look like. It's like CDs, you know, you've got the CDs in your cupboard and you know this is Mozart and that is, um, what is the new thing? <laughs> M and M. And, <laughs> and you all know they're different and they've got different labels. But, you know, when you put them in the CD player, it's a different story, you know, then you hear what's on the CD. We are at the point in genetics where we know what CD is playing. You know, we know the CD looks like this, and that's the gene, gene, we can see it, but we really don't know what's actually written on the CD, or on this gene yet. But epigenetics is the study of that. So, epigenetics is the expression of genes. So, for instance, epigenetic changes happen in the brain. They've done research in patients who have committed suicide in Canada. Um, and they've, they've dissected these brains of the individuals in terms of the, in the, in the hippocampus, which is the area that makes us remember. And they've looked at that and they said, oh, let's look at that and see if there are any epigenetic changes in these individuals' brains. And they found that people who commit suicide have a lot of epigenetic changes in their brains. And that means that the expression of, of, of how they function in their brains due to either environmental or other factors influences their brains to a point where it starts changing. And that then leads them to certain behaviors like suicide. Okay. So epigenetics is quite important because this is our adaptation to the environment. This is how we adapt to the environment. So let's look at epigenetics. Okay, so there are various kinds of things with epigenetics. There's acetylation. Now acetylation is a chemical reaction in which a small molecule called an acetyl group is added to another molecule and acetylation of proteins may affect how they act in the body. Now you get acetylation of proteins and everything in our bodies is a protein. And then you get histone acetylation. It's generally associated with a permissive transcription state by negating the positive charge associated with the lysine that is used in histone tails. Now this is very difficult to understand. So I've made a picture. This is a gene. Okay, you've all seen the genes. We've got 46 of them. Okay. Now if you take a little piece of a gene, you'll see there is, this is what the gene looks like. But it's still bundled up. Now if you look at it further closely, you'll see it looks like this. Okay. So it makes these little circle, circles. If you if you examine it even further, you can see these little bubbles, okay. And, the, and it looks like, um, you know, the, it's wrapped around these little bubbles. So the genes are wrapped around these bubbles, which we call histones, okay. So you can see even further, 
these bubbles can be unraveled. So there's a piece of gene that becomes exposed. And then it looks like that. And that's where you get the double helix. Okay. So you go from this, which is all bundled up, and you look at it, and then you eventually have little pieces that can un unravel. But it's not unraveled. So the whole gene is unraveled. But if there needs to be, the gene needs to be activated, you unravel it, and there's a piece unraveled, and then you can use that piece of gene to make a protein or do whatever you want to do with it. Okay. Now, acetylation is the process by which you unravel these genes. So what they then do is they check and see these mechanisms and chemical reactions and all sorts of things they can do to see in the brain which pieces of gene was unraveled by testing the acetylation of that gene. And that tells you there was then an epigenetic change in that brain. Okay. So acetylation promotes an open chromatin state where that gene is exposed and then um, you know, while the effects of drug abuse are widespread, histone acetylation is changing throughout the brain after exposure to drug abuse, including cocaine, morphine, nic and nicotine, and others. So once you've used your drug, there is a lot of acetylation. And that acetylation is then transcribing proteins from your gene to start adapting to your environment, which is then epigenetic changes. And that is specifically how it happens that people then become addicted and start drug-seeking behavior. Because in the nucleus accumbens, this in particular happens, so that you then, you know, start forming this addiction. And it's part of the fact that you build up tolerance. Because, you know, if you <coughs> use one glass of wine today, and you use it every day, in a month's time you need two, in another six months you need a bottle. So that's tolerance to get the same effect. Now this is through acetylation and transcription of these genes through that little thing. So there's clearly genetic changes when you start abusing these drugs all <coughs> over the brain. And now the question is, would one be able, through medication or psychotherapy or some <coughs> kind of intervention or gene therapy, be able to change this transcription? That people would not transcribe and become addicted or form addictive behaviors. So that is the development in terms of that. <coughs> so a histone looks like this. So that little top that this thing that the that, that gene is wrapped around has got these little bubbles and they've got numbers H1, H2, H3, H4 now in general acute or repeated exposure to drugs of abuse including cocaine, ethanol, meth, morphine and methamphetamine increases global total cellular levels of acetylation of H3 and H4 of the histone and that makes the histone unwrap so that one can then transcribe Okay, so there's definitely <coughs> genetic changes or epigenetic changes when you start using drugs. Dr. can I ask you a question? So if a, if a child takes ADHD uh, medication um, <coughs> from the age of, say, six, right? Yeah. Th it's a very similar, similar kind of... Similar process. Is it? Cocaine yeah, Simi the similar process. And the interesting thing is, if you look at methylphenidate, which is Ritalin for ADHD, and you look at a drug like bupropion, Wellbutrin, which is a drug for antidep as an antidepressant, and you look at cocaine, they work in exactly the same place and they have the exact same mechanism. So cocaine and Ritalin is very similar in its action on the brain. So the question is, why is cocaine so addictive and methylphenidate is not so addictive? And that is how it binds to the receptor. So cocaine, for instance, would bind to the same receptor that increases your dopamine and your noradrenaline, but it sticks. So it binds to the receptor 73%, whereas bupropion or wellbutrin binds to the receptor 42%, and, uh, or, or, or Ritalin, and methyl, methylphenidate, and then wellbutrin 37 So because it binds and it goes off, so it doesn't build the tolerance and the dependence like cocaine. So there's also different mechanisms, but you're correct, it's the same kind of mechanism that would happen in, in terms of that. And that's why it's interesting if patients with schizophrenia take medicines from the start and they take it religiously or bipolar disorder, which is a chronic psychiatric disorder, they do not develop uh, chronicity necessarily. Because they can take one drug and they take it from the start and they're well controlled. Every time they get sick, because they stop their medication or they've got stress, whatever the reason is that they get sick, they have to increase their medication because the sickness also does this. 
transcribes the genes. Then you need more medicines to control this. So it's very important to, from the start, actually treat it very well from the beginning. Because the more you get ill, the worse your outcome because you change your whole genetic makeup. Okay. Okay. You also get methylation of that, of that DNA. Methylation is an epigenetic mechanism involved in the transfer of methyl group onto the C5 position of this, uh, a cytosine to form 5-methyl cysteine. But it's just... Methylation, so it's acetylation and methylation, and we can test that in the brain, what happens with methylation or acetylation in terms of epigenetic changes, okay? But I think the big development is going to come with this, okay? <coughs> and that is microRNA and long non-coding RNAs. Now, we've got a psychiatrist that just when you say microRNA, he's already eating his, his triple caramel salt with caramel ice cream because he loves microRNAs. But microRNAs are very interesting. Because microRNAs, and I think I might have a picture. Uh, yeah. MicroRNAs is, you know, you, this is your, 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 you have your double-stranded gene, okay? And it, if you unravel it, it looks like these spiky things. So you've got DNA, double. The D stands for double. So, but it's closed. So if you want to, do anything with your gene you have to open it up like a zipper and then you can add another zipper which is the rna the, which will then transcribe when it's outside of the cell into a protein now our whole body works on proteins you secrete proteins the whole time your immune system works on proteins so the gene transcribes this proteins to actually tell the body what to do it makes receptors a protein receptor in this area and a protein receptor in that area so the whole time the body is transcribing the DNA. So if you smell something, it unravels the gene and you transcribe it and you smell. So the whole body works on, on this whole mechanism which takes place the whole time, this transcription. Now, to make a protein, you have to have mRNA, messenger RNA, okay? So messenger RNA is also manufactured in the nucleus. But it forms a little piece of RNA, which we call messenger RNA. It zips to the DNA that unravels and, make, and goes out of the cell, goes into ribosomes and forms a protein. So that is how it works. But then you get in the cell microRNAs. Those are also formed in the cell, but they drift around the cell. And they look like this. It's sort of a double turned over on themselves RNA. A small piece of, of RNA, you know, so it's it drifts around but suddenly it has to do some work okay and form a little protein or do whatever they have to do and then an enzyme breaks down the tip releases the whole thing it can unravel and then it can form a small piece of protein in the body to act to form a protein that does something else okay now in the beginning they didn't know what these M, those micro RNAs were doing and then they were thinking, okay, what could this be, you know, because, but now we understand if you want to change genes and you want to insert certain genes or extract certain genes or cert form certain proteins in the body, you have to work with microRNA, okay. So that's how it works. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at um, how the vaccine is made, you know, if you look at COVID vaccine. Now this is very small, sorry, but you, how vaccine is made is you take an RNA, you form, you break it out eventually and you form, you get a micro RNA. So what they've done is through bacteria, they've been able to change the, the bacteria's gene to form specific RNA, small pieces of RNA, that you can inject into humans. So when they give you the RNA via the vaccines, they inject in actual fact a piece of genetic material into you. And that genetic material then activates the body to make a specific protein that resembles the spike protein of that virus. Now people say, oh, our genes are going to change and we're going to die and you're going to grow an ox head and all sorts of things. <laughs> which is not true because that gene is very specific to just form the spike protein. So it forms the spike protein, so your own body then makes the protein and then forms, um, 
antibodies against that specific protein. So when you're exposed to a virus, you already then have the protein. So that's why the vaccine takes a little while to work. So they already work using this in vaccine making, but they're also doing it in other certain diseases, like lung diseases for children. Um, Whoopers, what is that illness called again where the children have thick mucus? Um, cystic fibrosis. So in, you get four kinds of cystic, cystic fibrosis. They thought there was only one kind of cystic fibrosis. Now they've actually broken it down and they understand that there are four cyst types of cystic fibrosis because they've been able to identify the genetic variants of the cystic fibrosis. But one of the cystic fibrosis has got one locus. And what they do is they actually make RNA, they attach it to a virus. So sometimes you can attach it to a virus, you actually give the child the virus, and that virus inserts into the child's nuclei all over, and then changes the genes that are flawed, and replaces the flawed gene, and then the child is virtually cu is cured. So that you can do now with certain illnesses, if you know where to go. So, so gene therapy is really the future, and it all works on this microRNA principle. Okay. So hopefully, with um, we would be able to do the same with the cessation gene, because it's also on one locus. So if you can activate that cessation gene, you can actually make people stop, because they would have the ability then genetically to stop smoking or stop using alcohol, because you know, so that's probably where the future is lying in terms of, of neurogenesis and learning and then also genetically being able to do that. Because genetically we know that certain people can play a piano and should, some people should never touch a piano. Mm -hmm. You know, some people can play sport and some, you know, don't have ball scenes at all. That's a genetic makeup. Now you can change that genetic makeup. Certain people can stop smoking and some can't. And that's a genetic makeup. And you can change that genetic makeup. Okay. So that's probably where gene therapy is going to go. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Are you stunned into silence? No, no, no. I think that's very important and well explained, especially you know how they get to it. Thank you. Mm. It wasn't too complicated because it's complicated. No, it is complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Very. <laughs> Sorry, just, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, go. So, as far as dopamine XLT goes, mm. in terms of you know the expected reward, you know, uh, you reach the stage where you have the dopamine is received on the on the cue instead of the actual reward. So, in terms of like, okay, you wouldn't sell your car for salted caramel ice cream because you wait for cocaine. Yeah. Is it just a question of how much dopamine? the amount of dopamine, yeah. the amount of dopamine, and the tolerance that develops. Because certain things, you know, you're not going to, well, some people build up a tolerance for ice cream, but <laughs> normally, you know, you, you, don't, you, you don't build up a tolerance necessarily for food. You know, you get a reward because the surge in dopamine is minor. It's not that huge. But the surge in cocaine, for instance, is massive. You know, so that surge in cocaine is really, really big. So, so that's the, the, the problem is that. And then because the surge is so large, you need you build up a tolerance because the body has an ability to adapt to something too much or too little because there's a negative feedback loop in the brain so then you start excreting lots of dopamine then the brain says "Ooh, it's too much we've got to you know have a negative feedback loop to stop that kind of search and next time you sniff the cocaine you have less dopamine because your body is actually acting with a negative feedback loop to not have such large amounts of dopamine so now you did double the dose Ooh, then you get another search and then the body says "Ooh, we've got to suppress that again so that's how tolerance builds up and then when tolerance builds up, the more the tolerance, the more the addictive behavior. Because then you, know, you need more and more and more. And eventually, you know, the only way to get it and get enough money to pay for that is to sell things. You know, and do all sorts of that. And that, that's how the addictive behavior develops. And a lot of patients we know that have got massive addictive behaviors. They sell their car. And when they're really act, you know, well treated, they live normal lives. They don't sell their stuff anymore. And they're okay. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So obviously the, the nurture part of it is 
it's important to know. I mean, if you come from a family where alcohol is a big problem and you've got parents that abuse alcohol or you've got one parent that severely abuses alcohol, you're at a much higher risk, five times higher risk of developing an alcohol problem. So you must be made aware that you are one of those people that shouldn't start abusing alcohol because you're, you know, you're predisposed to become dependent already genetically. <coughs> so, so you've got to even be more careful. You know, so that's, that's important to know. No, there's n no, there's uh, in addiction. There's no 100. percent If it was 100 percent, you know, you know, nature, genetic, then then it's then you have to have gene therapy to change your genes. But there's different. I mean, there's a 50 percent nurture por portion as well. Absolutely, because that's yeah. the transcription is what we need to activate, and reactivate it by our therapy. And that's yes. why you know we develop the cognitive skills that we need. That's why it works. There would be some trigger factors as well. But that's why psychotherapy is so important because trigger factors is psychotherapy. You know, if you have a trigger factor that actually <coughs> triggers it. You see, and especially if you've been addicted before, that's why triggers are so important. And we tell patients don't go to parties where there's lots of alcohol, don't go to, into the bottle store, or don't get, you know, avoid your triggers, because the triggers immediately start releasing the dopamine. Mm. Already, you don't need the drug anymore. Yeah. Once you've been addicted, if you have a trigger, you have dopamine. Yeah. And then you start your searching behavior, because that's how you're wired. Your brain is wired to start walking to the nearest bottle store, or pimp, or dealer, or whatever. I have to have it. <laughs> You know, so that's how it works. <laughs> so that's why triggers, you have to avoid your triggers. That's when you start secreting your dopamine. In the beginning, it doesn't matter because that's only the drug that gives you that. Later on, it's the trigger that gives you the dopamine. So is that when your kids get so excited before Christmas and they yes. open their presents and then they sit with the presents around them and now they want to... Go eat the caramel ice cream. <laughs> yeah, it's often the planning of a holiday. You know, the planning of a holiday is something sometimes more exciting than going on a holiday. <laughs> that whole planning thing, you know. Yeah, so that's why the planning is so important because that's when you start secreting your dopamine. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, everybody fine. Thank you so much. Now it's time for your dopamine. <laughs>